uh, thank you very much for coming to the lecture. I don't know if it's me or the subject area or the sandwich and coffee, but that always works. But um, uh, first of all, thank you for coming. I feel quite nervous actually presenting this, nearly more so than the vibe of my PhD, which is, seems strange. And when I was putting together this presentation, um, I was trying to condense 100,000 words into 25 minutes. It's absolutely, it's impossible to do, to do it justice. And I could spend two, three days talking about this with PhD, and that's not what you want to hear. But what, are, what, what I'm going to try to do is, it, it's tease out some of the key issues that, that, that I discovered or I, I found. And these are my, my, my opinions based on three years of study, attending meetings, conferences, uh, residentials, and over 40 interviews with community representatives, statutory bodies, politicians, service providers, NGOs, that, that have really been involved in this area for 20, 30, sometimes 40 years, uh, dealing and responding to issues around Peace Walls. So, what I want to try and do is just to get across a couple of the things that have come out of my PhD, and that I hope that they will either um, still be a debate, some people may disagree with what I say, which is a good thing. Other people may agree, which is a good thing as well, because it means then that it validates their own views and opinions. But um, well, hopefully you all get something from it. First of all, uh, what I want to do is take it back to 1971. And at the beginning of the, the PhD, I spent a number of weeks in the Public Records Office looking at um, basically anything that happened around Peace Walls. Was there any documents about it? Was anything ever said about it? Did, was there any committees about it? And all of a sudden you came across this document that said top secret peace walls, you know, so you get really excited. And uh, <coughs> what, it, what it was, was it, it was a working group that was established in 1971 to look at the peace walls in Belfast, Northern Ireland um, politicians. And there had been about four or five peace walls had been built in the city. They, they, they weren't the formal structures that we see in Cooper Way, but the, the, the city had been officially demarcated by barbed wire and <coughs> these fences. But the working group in 1971, this is, this is what was said. It talks about an atmosphere of abnormality, how they're psychologically damaging, institutionalizes division, and there's a fear that they become a crutch and that the abnormal becomes normal, and the search for solutions set aside for another day, and that we must assert that no community can continue to rely indefinitely on such methods. So this was the thinking in 1971 with our policymakers about the peace law. So it's this, this notion that they were detrimental to the communities and they had a negative impact. So I proceeded through the document and they had a, they had a section in it about how to take them down, make it more. Now, if only it could be so simple. They <coughs> essentially felt that the problem in 71 was persuading neighboring communities to live together. If they could do that, then they'd solve the problem. And it was about encouraging and facilitating discussions between representatives. <coughs> The same language used then is the same language that's been used today. It's about building confidence, it's about developing partnerships and relationships. The only difference is they talk about well-meaning people from both sides. And I don't know what, what constitutes a well-meaning person in 1971, but that, that's the type of language and the people they were identifying in 71. But they had a two-stage approach. Take the steam out of it, and then create confidence, understanding, and friendship between opposing communities. That was the answer to the problem in 1971. Okay? And, in a sense, if we transfer the language, the language now we're talking about is understanding, is about confidence, it's about partnership. So it's the same type of language, it's just 40 years later. However, that didn't work, which we know. And they also, being politicians as well, they had a caveat in the document to say that if that doesn't work, what the, what the, the future would look like. So they felt that it was important to provide the maximum separation between opposing areas in Belfast. And an example they talk about is the Westlink and the Urban Waterway project. And they talk about making sure that the materials cannot be ripped up or torn out and used as missiles or for building barricades. So they dispensed with the ideas of partnerships and building confidence within the communities, and they moved towards advocating an approach of segregation and division. They also talked about creating natural divisions throughout the city, and we only have to look at the city to see examples of that, where factories were built, where motorways were put in place, where roads were put in place, where car parks were put in. The city was designed at that early stage to take account of the different cultural differences, religious differences between communities. But, at the end of the document, there's a, there's a, there's a letter 
and the letter is from a, a, a British civil servant. And, and the civil servant, uh, I just have taken a quote of what he said, because I think it's very poignant of what, what he says. I'll just read it out. He says, when a city is redeveloped, a pattern of life is laid down for at least a century. I find myself in disagreement on the proposals that the divisions in the community should be accepted as a feature of life for a hundred years or more. This seems a council of the square, and a spur which is, it is proposed should be expressed in terms of bricks and mortar. <coughs> so, at that stage in 1971, there was a British civil servant who was in complete disagreement with the plans that were being advocated, who said that these would have long-term ramifications for the city and for the people that lived in it. There was just I think that his, his, his words capture what was played out over the next 40 years. And I take this from uh, Neil Jarman's report of the Belfast Interface Project. Before I explain this, I just want to say that it's about the terminology of what we define as a peace wall, as an interface barrier, as a fence. Uh, David Cameron last year talked about 50 peace walls in Belfast. I worked off a number of 42 peace walls in Belfast. Neil, in his most recent report, has highlighted 99 barriers within the city. And this shows how the escalation of barriers throughout the city since 1969. And he gives a definition of the different types of barriers, whether it be space, whether it be derelict houses, whether it be car parks, whether it be factories, walls, fences, gates. So, uh, as you can see, the, uh, the most recent document has it around 99, and there's photograph evidence of all these different types of barriers. The ones with brackets are, are barriers that have been strengthened and heightened uh, in, in that decade. And we can see that there's 34 miscellaneous in that 34, there's no clear ownership of who owns 34 types of barriers within the city. But what I want to draw your attention to is the actors involved in the construction of the walls. So from 69 to 94, it was the British government from the NIO, largely input from the British Army and from the REC. That's really the, the sort of the, the close-knit circle that was involved in the development of the walls. And then from 95 to 99, we moved through the NIO with input from security services, from local communities, and input from local politicians and statute agencies. You know, there's a number of examples of where you have local politicians openly campaigning for the construction of peace walls and fences in their constituencies in relation to sectarian violence and disorder. And then throughout 2000, <laughs> the year 2000s, we had uh, the actors growing, so we have more statutory bodies, service providers, NGOs, <coughs> input from the PSNI, politicians. And then finally, under the Department of Devolution of Policing and Justice, Northern Ireland Executive took policy responsibility. So really, as far as the policy issue is concerned, our politicians have really only had ownership of it for about 18 months. So it's relatively new in that context <coughs> of policy making. But it just shows that from 69 to 2011, the expansive use of people and organisations getting involved in this area. So that takes me up to today. But why, why are we all here today? Why did I do a PhD? I suppose I ask myself now, oh, peace walls. <laughs> um, why are they so topical? And then, um, there's, there's, I have to take, uh, Kathy actually helped me significantly with this aspect of this piece of work, but there's six areas of, of, of why I, I see these to be significant today. I think there's, and, no single one is more relevant than the other, but together they, they, they've raised the profile of peace walls. They're structurally significant because they're a contradiction of, of the British government's normalisation attempts in, in Northern Ireland since 94. You know, the, the, the Ring of Steel has gone around the city. Army watchtowers down at the border have gone. Our barracks is, the Army barracks have gone. The uh, stationary patrols have gone. Troops off the streets. So the whole context of, of a military apparatus within the, within the country itself has moved. But peace walls remain, so they're a contradiction in the sense of attempts to normalise in the context of a, of a security apparatus in Northern Ireland. From a security perspective, I, I go back to 2008 and the construction of the peace wall in the Intervale Primary School in Hazelwood, and the argument that we, didn't have, we had no other response to sectarian violence disorder other than build on a peace wall. So, from a security pers perspective, it raises concerns about how can we make communities feel safe, how can we make people feel confident, and how can we address their security needs without construction barriers, without having forced segregation? From a health perspective, they're significant because we know the stats. We know the stats around prescribed medication rates, around alcohol dependency, around mental health issues, around life expectancy rates, around how, around how they're disproportionate for those that have to live close and within interfaces and peace walls as opposed to the wider sections of the community. So they have significant health impacts, peace walls. 
from a good relations perspective, the language is changing. You know, here, there's no more them and us. It's about good relations. It's about a shared city. It's about building relationships. It's about having meaningful dialogue with each other. It's about addressing the, the legacy of the past for want of a, of a better concept. And the peace walls are a visible reminder of the divisions that currently exist within our society. So, in the context of a good relations agenda, there are contradictions. They're financially significant for two reasons. Out of the 100 most deprived wards in Northern Ireland, 56 are in Belfast. All of the neighbourhoods of Peace Falls are within these 56 wards. So we know about issues around social inequality, we know about issues around unemployment, around <coughs> lack of investment, about financial ramifications for those that live beside Peace Falls. And then from a service provider's perspective, the violence and disorder still occurs around peace walls. So there's issues around policing peace walls, around policing the impact of violence and disorder around them. There's also issues around attracting investment uh, into these community areas. So from a financial perspective, they're significant. And then finally, from internationally, on two different levels. One, sometimes you question, what are we exporting? What, what does Northern Ireland have to offer in the context of exporting a model of peace and, and a peace process? You know, the political <coughs> process has, has been moving significantly uh, on different uh, agendas. But as far as the peace process, aside from the, the, the military aspect of the conflict, where have we moved in the last 15 years? And you can sometimes it come up in the interviews and in, in the, the people were working with international observers or international contacts and they were coming to Northern Ireland, they were coming to Belfast and they were questioning the significance of our own peace process. So the peace walls were a constant reminder about, again, how far we come in the, in the context of what do we export. And also, I know a lot of people don't like to go on about it, but the, the context of Mary Bloomberg's speech around economic investment, the anniversary of the Berlin Wall, these are different <coughs> international events or international individuals <coughs> who raise awareness, who raise issues in the media which focuses attention back on the walls. And just the other aspect of international is the explosion of the construction of walls at an international level. Cities, countries, borders, you know, we are not the only country that has walls. Walls are there's an expansion of walls being built and constructed on a global basis. But yet, we have the experience of 40 years of what the impact of these walls are. And we, we have went through the processes that have been constructed and now we're looking at the transformation. <coughs> so internationally, we have something to offer. So, in relation to the significance of walls, I think that collectively, these various issues have pushed the issue onto the agenda. Okay, so not one is more maybe important than the other, but taken together, they all have an impact. So, the, the PhD, which I'm not going to really go into that much in the context of maybe the, the, the laborious details, but basically, a, a, the PhD took the premise that under devolution, we would have politicians who wanted to make policy. We, uh, <laughs> I, I, I maybe naively, but I took the, the, the position that we would have an opportunity to make our own decisions. We have an opportunity to deal with the hard issues ourselves. And so I felt that public policy decisions would at some point have to be taken in relation to these walls. So that was the starting point. But to, to look at how peace walls could be conceptualized or addressed through a policy debate, I took three questions. I wanted to know how they were interpreted and defined, what has been the impact of previous policies and initiatives, and what are the political influences in the context of peace walls. So, I'm just going to briefly look at three key areas around problems, politics and policies, and then focus on the challenges and where, where we're going. The, the, the research in the context of problems, it's quite interesting because, you know, are peace walls a problem? And, and who are they a problem to? And who are they a problem for? You know, and if you ask that question as your starting point, it raises a number of issues. Because if they're a problem, then if you take the position that peace walls are a problem, then by virtue of them being a problem, there should be intervention and we should do something about it. If you take the view that they're a condition, well, a lot of people can live with conditions as opposed to problems. So my perspective was looking to see how much of a problem they are, who defines them as a problem, and what are the motivations and influences that go into how we construct peace walls as a problem. And you know, you, get, you have the usual uh, access to information for resident service providers, local government, politicians and NGOs, who identifies the key players. So you've got statistics. The statistics tell us about the levels of economic and social deprivation. They talk, t tell us about levels of educational attainment. They tell us <coughs> about access to opportunities, jobs, 
hotel activity throughout the city. <coughs> the statistics tell us that they're a problem. Focused events such as violence and disorder <coughs> in East Belfast, or violence in Ardoin, or violence in uh, sporadic incidents of violence across interfaces in West Belfast, tell us that we still have political and cultural differences between communities, and they get played out within the arena of peace walls. So the violence tells us that there's a, there's a problem with peace walls. And under devolution, our service providers have had opportunities to engage with local ministers and to tell them that they have problems in delivering services in a divided city. There's a cost, there are implications, there are a barrier to moving forward. So they also tell us that they're a problem. And then at the executive level, as far as attracting inward investment, as far as projecting Northern Ireland as a tourist attraction, the peace walls can be deemed problematic in the context that they are not, for the, for the, in, the, in the words of politicians, they're, they're not projecting the image that they want to project. So at that level, we have various signs that lead us to develop them into being a problem. But I wanted to look deeper than that, and I wanted to look at what are the dynamics and implications for loyalist and Republican urban working class communities. How do they define the peace walls? And there were similarities in the context of how those communities perceive peace walls in the sense that they acknowledge they're politically sensitive, it's a highly emotional issue. Community safety and security and policing is paramount when we're talking about them. Regeneration, economic investment and improvement to health and social well-being are all key issues that raise the profile of peace walls within those communities. However, there are other factors that go into how people classify the peace walls, especially within laws and Republican areas. And this is not to generalise, but there was the finding suggested that these were some of the issues that were playing on the, on the context of whether or not how problematic in, in the sense that if the, if the peace walls are, are, are seen, deemed as a problem, then the ultimate solution is the removal of the peace walls. But what does the removal of peace walls mean to that community? And what are the factors that community has to take into consideration when talking about peace walls? So in the context of the Republican and large communities, there was a similarity that they both had large community safety was key to any conversation about peace walls. But in the context of uh, conversations within the oil communities, there was a sense of vulnerability around the changing demographics within the city. There was an acknowledgement that issues around their own culture and identity in, in recent years had been, had been, there had been moves to, in some areas, to uh, restructure how that was being played out. Issues around bonfires, parades and flags and how they were being expressed were becoming more in the public domain. There was also a concern within certain parts of certain areas communities about the greening of Belfast as was referred to. Taurus was used as a number of, on a number of occasions in conversations about how there were no examples in the city of areas that were previously unionist or previously nationalist that had become unionist. As, but any cases where there were a change in the demographics or territory within the city, there was always the case of that the areas had become Catholic or nationalist as opposed to unionist or loyalist. And these were and these were some of the factors that were underlying conversations around peace walls within these communities because these were things that were influencing how they viewed the peace wall conversation. Alternatively, in the Republican community, aside from community safety, there's issues around housing willingness, the demand for space, an increase in population, and these are massive concerns within these areas around how this community can expand and work and expand to. So these are the underlying factors that were emerging from conversations, and I'm not saying this was the case across the city, but this was the case in, in, in some conversations that they were impacting on how these are real issues within these communities. Okay? The second area was around policies. And in the context of policies, <coughs> three sort of key areas emerged before, before I just focus on, the, on what a successful policy would look like. The majority of, of, of people felt there was a degree of scepticism about government initiatives in relation to interface communities and peace walls. There was argument that social deprivation, unemployment, violence, sectarianism, segregation continued to define urban working class communities in Belfast. There has been a number of, of, of initiatives uh, through the community voluntary sector, through the government sector, through international donors, and that, that you know there hadn't been that significant progress that people expected. There were also a uh, degree of disillusionment within these communities around economic dividends from the peace and political process, about how much interest was actually being focused on interface communities. And these were, these were underlying factors that impacted on people's views of policy. 
Also, there was a degree of suspicion about policies uh, around the motivations and the agendas that were being uh, pushed forward by government in relation to a peace walls policy and strategy. There was a number of examples used where regeneration programs had resulted in, in um, communities decreasing in population size and you know, subtly changing the boundaries of communities throughout the city through a, an agenda pursued by the government under the auspices of regeneration. So these are some of the factors that were influencing people's ideas about policy. But what we did was we asked what would a successful peaceful policy look like? And these were the sets of questions that people felt would underline the peaceful policy. Was it acceptable to everyone? What's it going to cost? Is there mass public support, political buy-in, and is it practical? And basically, everybody said it was practical under, the condition, under four conditions. How it would be implemented? Would it be forced from top down or would it be bottom up? A realisation that a holistic approach to peace walls wasn't going to work in the sense that attached to these peace walls are a number of personal stories, events and memories and that this requires local solutions to local problems. So a, guide, a set of guiding principles contained in legislation is what people were talking about but they need to be innovative and individual approaches to specific areas within the city. Community safety again was raised as paramount. But it was also noted that any process had to complement other issues around investment, regeneration, health and social well-being, and an increase in opportunities for local communities. So we can just focus on bricks and mortar, which we're well aware of. In the context of, of the wall of a policy being accepted with everyone, they felt that it had to be marshaled by four guiding principles. Understanding, trust, confidence and security. Understanding in the sense that this had to be more than a policy that looked at taking down physical barriers. There had to be trust between communities and between those advocating the process, not just between communities, but between government and between communities. There had to be confidence. Communities, first of all, had to feel confident themselves in participating in the process. But then there had to be confidence across communities. And finally, security. Security had to be central to any proposal. And this in relation to how the PSNI and community safety and DOJ would look at policing with the community within these specific areas. In relation to what it was going to cost, there had to be a shift in, in the way of it's going to, in the context of, of cost, it was, the shift, there had to be a shift on where the cost of doing nothing would be far greater than spending time and resources now. Okay? In relation to mass public support, it was a, it, it became quite clear, I mean, what is public support for a policy in peace walls? The general consensus was that 99% of the population really have very little interest in peace walls. You know, they may wish to see them down, they may say that it's a very negative thing, but if asked to commit time and resources, effort, money, or have to move resources away from the old area to actually address the issue, then it becomes a different, a different context. So the question about who should be consulted and what do we mean by mass public support for a policy? Do you go one street back, two streets back, ten streets back? Is it a community? You know, what are we exactly talking about? And the thing that I wanted to note here is that I think that we're in danger about developing a hierarchy of types of segregation and division. Just because you've got a peace wall, does that mean then that you get X points because you've got issues? Like, how do we different? Are, are we in danger of labelling this a peace wall process, which may be a contradiction of being work, but are we in danger of, of creating a hierarchy of those who feel that their segregation is worse than others? And what does that say for us in society then, that if we only start to target those areas with physical manifestations, so, in the context of mass public support for a policy and peace wars, it raises more questions about that, that danger of creating a hierarchy. And finally, political support. It was taken that there needed to be political support at all levels for any process of peace wars. And there had to be a distinction between acknowledging political support and actually putting time, effort and resources to a process. Finally, in relation to politics, the, the issue around politics was based on three key areas, the structures of governance, the wider public mood, and relationships between communities. As I said earlier, the majority of people felt that peace were a Belfast phenomenon, <coughs> they were a Belfast issue. Actually, there was the most over a significant number all, all indicated that Belfast weren't in the same context that this was to be deal, dealt with it from you know, another perspective. This was a Belfast issue that needed Belfast solutions. So, and in relation to the relationship between communities and elected representatives, the same issues that people are aware of was in relation to if this is going to be about a policy process, how can, how can communities influence policy through their relationships with politicians? 
So it comes down to, again, the, the key area there was with the loyalist communities and their relationships with politicians, and that would negate their role in any, any policy process. What I want to focus on briefly is the structures of government. Because, and again, this research <coughs> was finished last year at a few points, but already things are starting to move. There, there was minimal confidence from interviewees in relation to community. Sorry, I should have said at the outset that there's just a fire alarm test at about a quarter past one on the Wednesday night call. But sorry, I'll stop. Make a note. The, the, the findings suggest that there was minimal confidence with the executive to make decisions that related to peace force. They pointed to the lack of movement and decision making and addressing issues such as the legacy of the past. The raised all cash site, government barracks, although we, we've seen recently that there's been, there's been movement then. But people, people said that, to, that peace walls would divide opinion at a political level. So it would be very difficult to get that collective support at the executive for this issue. There was, a, there was a, a, an argument that the executive worked within a silo mentality, that government departments worked in isolation, and that peace walls was an issue that transcended government departments, but yet there was no joined up thinking or cross departmental working on the issue. It was noted that the DOJ had taken responsibility for peace walls, but the argument was that it's already been, that it's been noted that peace walls transcends a multitude of social and even economic issues. So it's, it's fantastic that it's, that it's getting recognition within the DOJ, but this is an issue that needs transcend across all departments. Um, it was also felt that aside from the DOJ that other departmental department or other departments were reluctant to take on responsibility and ownership with Peace Walls. That it was an issue that they, they would be preferred to siphon off to the DOJ. It's also in order that the current economic climate was not really sort of conducive for developing new and innovative ideas around regenerating Peace Walls interface communities. But the paradox is is this about leadership, legitimacy, and confidence. And it comes to the very end when I have sort of an idea of, of where this is going. The paradox is that although the people were very critical of the executive and very critical of, of, of politicians and very critical of, of, of processes to date, there was near the universal agreement that, that this had to sit within the executive at the top table, that this had to have executive sign of approval, for want of a better word, in a sense, the symbolism which would provide leadership, which would provide confidence, and which would provide legitimacy for whatever went on beyond that. So, although they were critical of the, of the mechanisms of government, they felt that this had to sit there. Okay? That was the, sort of the slight paradox in, in the context of, of where this was going. So, I've series of, I've noticed a series of challenges, and there's five challenges that, I, that have emerged from the research that I just want to draw attention to. Two are community challenges and three are implementation challenges. And the first is, is what does confidence look like? And since I started looking into this three years ago and then even working before that, people talk about community confidence. Politicians, in a sense, sometimes fudge the issue. We, can't, we can only move the speed of communities. The communities need to feel confident to take forward ideas and processes. What do we mean by community confidence? What, what, what are we trying to say? You know, are we trying to fund community confidence? Are we trying to generate it? Are we asking those people that have worked through the conflict, those people that have worked through the peace and conflict and transformation processes to, to, to facilitate engagement around confidence? You know, 1971, they were talking about confidence. But yet I'm still not clear about what we mean. I know that it's about having confidence within your own community. I know that it's having, having confidence with your neighboring community. But I don't know how we measure it. I don't know how we go about building it. And I don't know how it fits into a process. And I think there's a danger of relying too much on community confidence being the silver bullet that will address the issues of peace walls. We need to see this within the context of regeneration, social investment, employment, education, and creating opportunities. And there's sometimes a, a danger of, of focusing too much on creating confidence so communities <coughs> can take this forward. And also the question is, who's responsible for supporting this confidence building work? second area is around how do you reconcile competing agendas? And it struck me that the longer people live with a problem, the less pressing it becomes. And, and it sort of rings true to, to one extent. You know, the longer something is there and it is an issue, we sometimes start to turn a blind eye to it and we start to, you, you know, really we normalize it and, it and it becomes less of a problem and it feeds into to, to my conclusion. But I've alluded to issues there around identity, culture, 
expressions of history and, and what that means for a community. I've also talked about issues around an expanding population. And you know, if we take this down to its most simplistic term, simplistic way of looking at it, the question we need to ask is how can we reconcile two competing agendas where, where a community doesn't feel that it is a threat of another community. And if we can if we can do that, if we can take the threat of fear away from two, from a community being scared of what the impact of a policy decision, i.e. the removal of a wall, would do in both contexts, then we're halfway there. And the, I'm not entirely sure about how we, we, we begin that process of reconciling competing agendas, but I think that that it can't be looked at within the context simply of peace walls. And, and that's why and that's something that frustrates me is that when we talk about segregation in Northern Ireland, we just focus on the media always shows Cooper Way Peace Wall, but they show Lawless the Republican communities in Belfast. But this is this is a, sort of a wider issue. Uh, but we're throwing money at, at an issue in, in Belfast in the context of peace walls, and we need to be clear that this is going is going beyond that specific context. As far as implementation challenges, First one, and a real big one for me, is roles and responsibilities. And what there's a, a significant interest in this subject area. You know, just because you look at the turnout here today, and, and that's fantastic to see. And you know, it's in the media a lot, and there's people are doing different pieces of work, and the, the interest is fantastic. But I'm concerned at a different level. And you know, this is just an example of, of something. This is not a complete picture, but. What's in DFA? You've got the CSI document, you've got the Social Investment Fund, you've got the Program for Government, you've got the Department of Justice Community Safety Consultation, you've got those fantastic initiatives, Alexander Park and Northumberland Street, you've got the International Fund for Ireland, you've got Atlantic, you've got Belfast City Council's Interface Strategy, you've got the CRC Interagency Working Group, you've got the Community Partners Group, you've got the Fire Service Removals Group, and I'm sure there's others I missed. But my point is, how, how does this fit? What is our vision? What does all this do? It's fantastic that there's this interest in the subject because this is one of the, the most significant visual reminders of the conflict that we have. But, and everybody is keen to get involved. I'm not questioning motivations in any way, but, but I, I think that we're missing the, the, the opportunity to harness this and to, and to actually focus our attention and the energy that people have and the resources and the funding in a more joined up way. I don't think we really have a clear picture of where we're going. And we don't seem to have a mechanism which oversees the work which provides quality assurance, or which makes sure that everything is complementing everything. So in essence, I think that it's at the highest level, at OFND, AFM level, at the executive level, the issue is being fudged, and there's still that ownership placed on communities. <coughs> and it's just that communities need to come forward with the ideas to develop this, which is leading to lack of cohesion, clarity, and structure around the process of dealing with the walls. So there is an absence of a single clear legislative framework outlining how peace walls should be removed. But yet it's ironic that legislation still exists for the construction of peace walls. It still sits under the Justice and Security Act of 2009, Section 29, where the Secretary of State can still take ownership of land in response to issues around protecting communities. But the legislation still exists for building them. There's nothing concrete there. It's, it's talked about in all these documents and it's talked about in all these funding applications. It's talked about at the community level, but it's still not there at that level. Finally, competing visions for the future. Again, are we clear about what we really want? The research findings suggest that the people have different opinions about what the transformation or removal of peace walls would actually look like. When I started this work, I didn't even talk about the removal of peace walls. I talked about the transformation of interfaces, the regeneration of interface communities. My ultimate goal was to find out what people felt about the removal of peace walls, but there were some cases that I couldn't even talk about that. The removal of the wall, it was more about regenerating communities with the the goal of removing the wall at the end of that process. So my question is, are we really clear about what we want, about what our vision for the city is? You know, what might work in Tigers Bay New Lodge might not necessarily work in Suffolk Leonard. Inn. The difficulty, I think, is managing people's expectations, but I don't think we, we've done that yet. I think that there's a danger that people will start measuring, like for like. So what I did in, in Tigers Bay New Lodge, well, they didn't do that there. And people might get very protective of their own ideas, people might get protective of funding, people might get protective of their own initiatives, which takes out the idea of, of good learning, it takes out the idea of sharing knowledge and experiences. So that's my other fear is that we still haven't nailed about what our vision for the future is. So, glad to finally the way ahead. 
I think we need to harness the energy and interest that is generated just by that previous diagram. I think that we have a window of opportunity now to start making practical positive differences to the landscape. And this is what it's about. It's about changing the landscape of the city in both our minds and physically in urban working class areas. And we need to really grab that now because I've said already problems can sometimes turn to conditions. We may miss the opportunity that we have right now. I think it's about momentum, small initiatives, which is a move away from the status quo about what went before it, where people actually see a difference and where that removes the, the, the fear and the threat that if a wall comes down, I am not threatened about who I am, I am not threatened to be a Protestant or I am not threatened to be a Catholic or I am not threatened to be a nationalist or a unionist or a loyalist or a republican. It means that I can live my life and the wall is not uh, a danger to who I am. I think that there are a number of pieces of work ongoing, the BIP stuff, the CRC work and the interfaces. There are a number of barriers that could come down tomorrow. You know, there are a number that, uh, immediately. Granted, they are not the Cooper way of this world, but they are small gains in a very politically sensitive and emotionally charged area. Finally, uh, in relation to confidence, investment and regeneration, yes, it is about creating confidence, but confidence on its own will not be enough. We need to look at investment, jobs, education, health. I'm talking about increasing opportunities. And if you don't bring answers to these types of issues, then all the confidence in the world will not mean anything. And that's why there's a danger of, of, of seeing this being the sole remit of the DOJ, or see, be seeing this as the sole remit of a specific department. This, is, this transcends all areas of government. So finally, how do we drive this forward? I don't have an answer. What I do know from the research is that it's not top down, that it's not bottom up. The evidence suggests that what is required is a combination of the two. And there's an argument, some will agree, some will disagree, that an institution like Belfast City Council is the best place to harness that energy and interest, to work with NGOs, to work with the CRC, to work with community groups, to work with funders, and to hold the executive to account and the departments to account, but to also hold communities as well to provide oversight, but to provide support, and to provide uh, confidence for those processes. You know, if we take the, the starting point, the peace world is currently looked at in isolation,